what are the most fundamental requirements for a child to grow up healthy? They need plentiful and nutritious food, shelter, love, and sleep. But those are just the most basic requirements. In order to develop healthy and normally, children need to be stimulated. They need to play. Play is crucial to healthy brain development. Play is how children learn to interact early on with the world around them. Play is also a form of exercise, and we all know we need to exercise. Exercise makes us feel good. It plays an important role in our physical and emotional health. But over time, we need to think about how these kids could play to make things better. As we move forward and think about keeping kids healthy and safe, despite our best efforts, life can be completely unpredictable, and children can get sick. As a pediatric resident, I learned early on that my passion was in caring for the most critically ill infants and children in the hospital, those who were recovering from acute trauma, sudden and major surgery, and major medical illnesses in the pediatric intensive care unit, or Pick you. Every year, 250,000 children are admitted to pediatric ICUs every year, and almost 2% of those patients will unfortunately die in the ICU, a number that has actually gone down significantly thanks to major technological advances. But at what cost? Even though we're saving more children's lives, Longer ICU stays and high-tech interventions are leading to many of these kids leaving the hospital with a very different quality of life than the one which they had before their hospital admission. When I started training in the PICU, I started making several observations. Children were on heavy doses of medications when they are on the ventilator, including opioids like fentanyl. They had fluorescent lights above their head constantly, and these medication and pumps were constantly alarming and beeping. Their eyes were closed, but were they actually sleeping? Were they experiencing the natural restorative sleep that is so crucial to healthy brain development? The answer was absolutely not. In fact, they were experiencing something very different. Our research showed that these kids were having hallucinations in the hospital, Many of them were even having nightmares after they were discharged to home. Clearly, the expectation of recovery after critical illness was very different from the reality. For decades, we've had hospital routines in place that have prioritized the staff convenience in lieu of patient sleep. How many of you would feel good if you were woken up in the middle of the night to have an x-ray at 2 a.m.? or to be given a bath at 3 a.m., to be picked up and be put on a scale at 4 in the morning. Why do we do it? We do it because it's easier. It's convenient. Daytime is all hustle and bustle. Nighttime is a time for us to start to catch up what didn't happen during the day, not necessarily a time for patients to sleep. Speaking of sleep, how many of you in the room have had general anesthesia before? So just a few of you. Um, when I'm not in the ICU, my other hat is as an anesthesiologist. And when we talk about putting you to sleep, it's very ironic because you're not actually experiencing natural sleep at all. What you're experiencing is a state of very heavy sedation that puts you into a controlled coma. We do that to keep you safe, to make sure that you don't remember your surgery or feel anything, and to ensure that you wake up feeling comfortable. In the operating room, we do that for a few minutes or hours. So not a big deal, right? But in the ICU, like this young man, we do it for days, weeks, even months. Why? Because, again, we want to keep these kids safe. We don't want them to pull out their lines, tubes, and drains. We want them not to remember what we think is a traumatic ICU experience. So we create a culture of immobility in the pediatric intensive care unit. 
When I was starting to make these observations, there was a movement starting to stir in the adult critical care medicine world. They were finding out that promoting sleep for these critically ill adults, getting them early exercise-based physical therapy, and giving them minimal sedation was actually leading to them spending less time on the ventilator and spending less time in the hospital. This was a movement that they will later call ICU liberation. I was fascinated. Were these principles that we could even think could be translated to our critically ill infants and children? Could we even dream of having children sleeping naturally at night and being awake and alert during the day? Was it even fathomable that a kid could be walking the hallways with a breathing tube? I didn't know the answer, but I knew I wanted to find out. And anytime you're tackling a paradigm shift of this level, you need to surround yourself with amazing people and understand your own limitations. I, as a physician in the pediatric ICU, am not in the trenches 24 hours a day. It's these people, the multidisciplinary care team, taking care of these critically ill kids at the bedside every single minute. So I surrounded myself with these people and I asked them, how do we tackle this challenge? There was a little worry and trepidation, but in order to forge the future, we had what we needed. We had people, we had energy, and we had passion. Now, like with most first meetings of any new movement, you spend the entire first hour trying to pick out a new name. It has to be cool and sexy. And Pick You Up was born. We were really excited to the name, but now we had a lot of work to do. So over the next several weeks, we spent a lot of time tackling the challenges that we would have to face in order to create a pragmatic solution to creating a healing environment for critically ill children. As you can see, many of these interventions were common sense. Let's open the shades at 9 a.m. and get some sunlight in to improve their circadian rhythms. Let's make sure they have their bed, their bath, and their weight by 11 p.m. at the absolute latest. Let's get the experts in exercise, our physical and occupational therapists, to the bedside early instead of waiting till all of our acute resuscitation is finished. We had a lot of pushback from the rest of the ICU staff. Obviously, this was the first unit in the entire world that was taking a systematic approach to this. And our goal wasn't to start getting every single kid in the ICU walking on day one. We wanted to start piloting concepts sequentially. So this is Brooke. Brooke was our first pick-you-up champion. At the ripe age of 10, we asked her whether she was willing to take on this challenge with us. And with minimal sedation and promoting her sleep and getting her up and moving early, Brooke walked the hallways of our PICU with a breathing tube on a ventilator, which was completely unheard of in our unit. She actually went to the playroom, played with some Barbies, and went back to her room. We were ecstatic, and we celebrated this huge success, and we made sure that every single person in the unit, even the ones who weren't working that day, knew what had just happened to see the possibilities. We even bought a cake. <laughs> As the successes started to pile up, there were more and more cakes and more and more excitement. And our culture of mobility was official. And the best part was nothing bad happened. We figured out that it was safe and it was feasible. However, we did learn that sometimes you need to get creative. So I'd like you to meet Sydney. Sydney, the day before this photo was taken, had just had a big open heart surgery. Her nurse was an early pick you up adopter. And the next morning she said, Sydney, you're going for a walk. As you can see here, Sydney wasn't having it. <laughs> and who can blame her? She's two years old. She has a fresh, large chest incision, and she has multiple tubes, lines, and drains hanging from that little body. So luckily, her parents came to the rescue. They remembered that she had rolled into the operating room in a little Tyke's Cozy Coop car, and she absolutely loved it. The problem was, 
we didn't have a cozy coupe car. So we went and we borrowed one. And what you'll see next is how creativity can overcome fiery toddler spirit in sandals. You're doing so great. Such a great exercise. Those legs. <laughs> Feel the burn. Feel the burn. Yeah. Look at those legs go. Awesome. Sydney went around our 40 bed ICU exactly four times in that koozie coop car. And she felt so sorry for us that she came back after she went home and donated us our very own cozy coupe car with a personalized license plate. <laughs> Many of you have heard that it has been a very tough year for the flu, especially for kids. And Alex here is no exception. Flu ravaged his little body with multi-system organ failure. He was on the ventilator for over a week. And over time, as it became time for him to walk, he was not interested. All it took was his physical therapist showing up with a tricycle at the bedside to get this smile on his face. And you can see, even in the PICU, the helmet is on. Safety first. Whether you're a child or an adult admitted to the hospital, you miss your home and the things that you love most in your home. And Reese here, again, was no exception. Reese was the victim of a big fire and ended up with an amputation and multi-system organ failure requiring full cardiac support. As Reese began to recover from her illness, she started to remember the things that she missed. And there was nothing she missed more than Pantene, her dairy cow. That's right, Reese's parents are dairy farmers. And to lift her spirits, the hospital staff came together with her family because she couldn't go home to see Pantene, we brought Pantene to the hospital. That's right, an adult <laughs> cow was in the courtyard of Johns Hopkins Hospital. And before you knew it, Reese was riding her tricycle around the unit with her helmet on, on cardiac support. So if there's a theme that you can see here, it's that we were finally seeing kids being kids at a time when fun seemed like the last thing that was even possible. So we were excited. Now that we had created a culture of mobility, what was next? Well, we wanted to tell everybody in the world about it. And even though we published a study of our results in a well-known journal, we felt that the highest impact of our work was going to be disseminating this information not only to the medical professionals that are going to pick up that journal and read it, but to all of the people in the trenches taking care of these critically ill kids to show them what was possible. So we capitalized on social media. That's right, we're taking a turn here. We're going to talk about social media. So how many of you in the room, please raise your hands, have a personal Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook account? Excellent. Now put your hands down. How many of you have a professional Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook account? Okay, maybe a smattering of hands there. Social media has revolutionized, especially in the healthcare field and all different fields, how we interact and collaborate with people across the globe. It's possible to collaborate with someone that you would never have had the chance of meeting in person in any other way which is absolutely incredible. And if you use some very well-placed hashtags, that reach can be exponential. We started sharing our work with Pick You Up using hashtag PedsICU and hashtag ICU Rehab, sharing our inspirational stories and insights, a picture of two nurses walking a baby down the hallway. And over time, the impact was amazing. We started to see units from across the world sharing their own stories, inspired by what they had seen from Pick You Up in Brazil, Asia, Australia, Europe, the list goes on. And seeing these stories inspired us to go back the, to the grind and start pushing the envelope even further. So how can all of you start to forge the future? This room is filled 
with amazing talent and brilliance. You all have unique ideas that can truly change the world. It's possible you've shared them with someone, but it's possible that you've only kept them in your own head. So today I challenge you to create your own intellectual community on social media. Open a professional academic Twitter account. Upload a professional photo, have a professional handle, and start following people that you respect, organizations that do good work, and strong news outlets. It's okay to start out being what we call a lurker, where you just kind of watch what's going on, not really interacting, figuring out how it all works. But over time, start to engage, start to interact, talk about topics that you're very passionate about. I think you'll find out that over time, your academic and professional world will be opened up thanks to the wonders of social media. However, there's always a couple rules that go along with professional and academic social media use, but also with personal use. So I'd like to offer some basic rules. Sapna's basic Twitter rules. <laughs> Number one, don't ever sacrifice collegiality due to a difference in opinion or post information that could negatively impact your professional reputation. There are a lot of opinions out there on social media. Refrain from posting about personal hot button topics and instead stick to tweeting about things that reflect your views and practice in a positive light. This is another excellent reason to have two separate accounts, one personal and one professional. Second, don't forget to cite the source. Just like academic writing, it is crucial to always give credit where credit is due, whether that's including their Twitter handle if they are sharing a photo of theirs or an insight or information. And finally, if you take anything away from my social media rules for professional Twitter use, always remember, a tweet lasts a lifetime. <laughs> Thank you.